Good morning, welcome to Zion. Hi, Craig. It's good to be back in, in this place together. I got tired of being iced in at home. I imagine I'm not the only one. <laughs> Let's just start with announcements. Does anybody have anything to remind us of? Next weekend is our Zion family retreat at Drift Creek Camp. Um, we'd love to have as many people as possible come. You can come for the whole weekend or just part of the time. It is helpful if you could sign up today on the sign-up sheet in the, in, on the bulletin board or um, in the bulletin it has Jenna Oyer's phone number. If by tomorrow evening you can let her know because Drift Creek needs to know for meal preparation and buying food. Um, if you just want to come for Saturday or only for one night, uh, you can totally do that. That's, that's totally fine. When you sign up, say, I'm going to be here on... Saturday and Sunday from sun Saturday lunch to Sunday brunch, just so we know what meals we have to pay for. Um, oh, the retreat is free. It's, we have a budgeted item, line item for the retreat. Um, it doesn't co quite cover everything, so we do have, we'll have a um, silent auction. So if you have items you wanna bring for a silent auction to help offset the cost, that would be good. And no Sunday school down in primary department next Sunday because of families being out of camp. Good morning. As some of you may know, um, I'm an elder here uh, at Zion, and it's good to get up every once in a while and remind folks of exactly what the elders do. So this is from the Elders Handbook. Uh, the elders partner with pastors in developing a common vision for the life of the congregation and share in spiritual oversight and pastoral care of members. Elders work with pastors to oversee and implement ministries pertaining to the spiritual and relational life, care and guidance of the congregation, which may include counseling, conflict transformation, preaching, teaching, church life, and worship rituals. Elders consult with and advise pastors in matters of pastoral and congregational care that require oversight and confidentiality. Uh, elders work with the pastors to discern new direction, ministries, and practices necessary for changing needs while maintaining consistency with Zion's vision to discern and dis uh, discontinue activities that are no longer needed nor helpful in consultation with the leadership table and the congregation. Elders also connect with people within the congregation. And the, the uh, elders right now are myself, Andy Colom, uh, Kara Krupp, uh, Dave Yoder, and our newest member is Kristen Oaks. So I don't know if any of them are here. I think Kara, I see you, but I don't know if anybody else is here. So Kara, can you wave? You don't have to stand up. <laughs> Did I miss somebody? Oh, hi, Kristen. You're not sitting in your normal seat, Kristen. Thank you. Good morning. We support the Aware Food Bank in Woodburn, and this week they're going to have a grand opening. But on Thursdays, this Thursday and the following Thursday, if you want to tour their new state-of-the-art, sophisticated, two-story building, you can go there from two to four in the afternoon to get a tour. So it's a fantastic looking building from what it came, what it was before, 
and we have several members here that go weekly to help at the, the Aware Food Bank. Thank you. Okay, for our call to worship, I'm going to be reading Psalm 89, 1 through 4. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Thank you, God, for loving your people through all generations. Open our ears to hear your words today. Amen. Lois. Today we're going to begin our singing with singing of the the love of is the psalm says it the best i will sing of the love of the lord forever my love of the lord forever your unfailing love will last forever your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens i had a hard time trying to well, i it was easy to find songs that went along with this but it was hard to sing them inside myself because the whole world is i mean it's terrible all the wars and the politics just seems to be getting worse and worse. And then on top of it, the ice storms and the people getting killed. And on top of it, I can't sing very good anymore. I turned old and I just croak. <laughs> and it's awful. And I had a hard time being sincere. And then I went to the second part of our scripture for today, which is the story of the um, person uh, possessed by the devil. And even this irritated me because I usually love that story of being possessed because I can relate to it and I can also see other people that are possessed and it's so wonderful the power of God to just speak a word and have it flee but what really irritates me is why God had to put them into the pigs I mean seriously <laughs> pigs have eyes and it really irritated me and so it just kind of helped my funk and um, I think Steve will give us some beautiful illumination on the pigs today. But I had to get back into the mood to sing some songs of praise to God. And I got there by thinking of this power of God that is really transcendent. It's beyond what's happening in the world. We're connected to something much deeper, much longer, much more eternal. And that I want to praise God for. I want to praise God for his mighty power that can bring out the demons and bring peace. So we'll start this a little bit gently with a song, um, page 95 in the Purple Book, and then we'll build up to the power of God. Okay, 95 in the Purple Book.
triple book and turn one page to 95. This song is in both books and it's a little more inclusive in this book, so watch for the words. Sorry, I'm unorganized today. Didn't allow myself enough time. Okay. Please stand.
You may be seated. For our offering prayer, please turn to 1022 with your responsive reading. And note that the, uh, there are two offering boxes on the wall, one here and one in the back now. Ten twenty two. 1022. Holy One, as you are faithful to us, may we be faithful to you. Faithful with our time and energy, faithful with our possessions and wealth. Receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to make real your reign of love, justice, and peace in our world. Amen. Please stand and pass the peace.
silence, frenzied, unseen spirit, unclean spirit. It's time to us it down. And turn to page 630. For some reason, this song didn't make it into the purple book either. 630 in the blue book. Yeah, the old one. Silence, frenzied, unclean spirit, cried God's healing holy one. Cease your ranting, flesh can't bear it, flee as night before the sun. At Christ's voice, the demon trembled from its victim madly rushed, while the crowd that was assembled stood in wonder, stunned, and hushed. Lord, the demons still are thriving in the gray cells of the mind, tyrant voices shrill and driving, twisted thoughts that grip and bind, doubts that stir the heart to panic, fears distorting reason's sight, Guilt that makes our loving frantic, dreams that cloud the soul with fright. Silence, Lord, the unclean spirit in our mind and in our heart. Speak your word that when we hear it, all our demons shall depart. Clear our thought and calm our feeling, still the fractured, warring soul. By the power of your healing, make us faithful, true, and whole. I'll play, the, I know this is a new song, I'll play the melody one time and then we'll sing it.
it's so concrete. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit must come down and set our spirits free. And after that tortured song, I really invite the Holy Spirit setting us free. It's time for the children's story. Please come up here and join me. You know, we always say it's for the children, but I think anyone of any age could come up here if they wanted to. Would we welcome them? Yeah? Anybody of any age? Come on over. in our church building. Does anybody know what these are for? There's one in the nursery, one in the kitchen, one in the office. What are these? Baskets for Band-Aids. They're like a first aid kit, yes? So in this first aid kit are Band-Aids and some ointment, and right now I want everybody to take a Band-Aid. You can put your trash right there, and would you please put your Band-Aid on a sore or a scrape that you might have? And if you don't have any sores or scrapes, just find somewhere to put it that you're going to be able to look at it, okay? While we're together. There, did everybody get a Band-Aid? There's a big one. Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, for joining us. There's a big one. You want a little one. Hang on, hang on. I've got to open the other one. I'm going to run these dry, so I'm going to have to get more Band-Aids for first aid kits. Did everybody get one? Would you open it? You pull it apart right where the little blue line is. Try to pull the pieces apart. And put your trash right here. Yes, thank you. If you have a sore or a scrape, please put your Band-Aid on it. Everybody got their Band-Aid on? They're kind of hard, and when you're kind of this emergency and you're bleeding and then you've got to open those Band-Aids, it takes a while. Somebody needs to come up with a new invention. Thank you. Right there, yes. Can you put that right up there? Lottie's got a little scrape right there. Thank you. Okay, so listen up. Do Band-Aids actually heal the sore? Do Band-Aids actually heal whatever you've hurt or scraped or punctured? Do they heal it? What do they do? They um, absorb some of the blood. What else does a Band-Aid do? 
it, yes, it takes time for God to heal our wounds, but a Band-Aid will protect it from what? Germs or dirt. Maybe you can't get that sore or um, scrape wet, so a Band-Aid would protect it. Well, you know, we've been listening to some stories about Jesus healing people in the Bible. And Jesus cares about every single person and wants to see them healed and whole. Isn't that a pretty good message? That Jesus would like for all people to be healed and whole? It's a good message. And that Jesus is concerned about people that are sick or injured. God loves and cares for everyone. So I hope when you look at your band-aid today, you can remember that, that God loves and cares for you, and that our bodies are created in a way that they heal. The way God's made our bodies, sometimes that means we have to rest, and we have to listen to doctors, and we have people that care for us and check the wound and change the band-aid when it needs a new band-aid. So we're grateful for all those things. Let's pray. God, thank you for the many ways that we learn of Jesus' healing touch on people and how people just had to look and believe that Jesus could bring them wholeness. Thank you that we can learn about your love and concern for us that you desire for us to be whole and healed. Amen. As we prepare to uh, both see and hear the scripture this morning, I want to invite you, if you want to turn to it, you can turn to Mark 5, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, and this is going to be on the screen behind me. It's good to be back together this morning. Thanks for working with us in the midst of ice and snow melting uh, by meeting last week uh, over Zoom, figuring the multiple people represented by the different Zoom logins. Uh, we probably had 80 or more uh, with us last week. Uh, not too long ago, meeting together online in the midst of bad weather wouldn't have been possible or at least just an option a tool that we really had in our toolbox for all the negative impacts of the COVID pandemic. It forced us to adapt to online interactions when necessary. I granted hope it doesn't happen very often, but it's good to know at least that when it does, we can make a shift when necessary. Next Sunday, uh, the 28th, Jerry Barkman, he'll be here to preach while I'm with my family at Drift Creek for our retreat. Then the following Sunday, February 4th is our church budget meeting. I get uh, that a budget meeting might not sound like fun for everyone, anyone, but I've come to realize that if you want to know the priorities of any organization, you look at the budget. In a congregationally led church like ours, this is an opportunity for you to both learn about and shape our priorities, us to shape our priorities for the upcoming year. Our church is set up in such a way that you have a voice in setting the budget priorities and giving final approval to that budget. So you should have received an email with our leadership table's proposed budget uh, planning. Significant amount of planning went into that. Uh, there's also in that email some comments about where and why adjustments have been made from last year's budget. If you haven't received that and want one, let me know. 
I'll work on making sure that happens. Also, that Sunday there'll be a fellowship meal. Uh, so if you can't stay for the budget meeting, that's okay. Just come and eat with us in fellowship. Then coming up two weeks after that, February 18th, Eric Massaneri, our conference executive minister, he'll be here to lead us through a service to recognize my ordination with the Pacific Northwest Conference. Uh, Ann and I's longtime friends, yeah, that, so we'll get there, we'll celebrate together. But Ann and I's longtime friends, uh, Patrick and Lori Allen, will also be speaking that Sunday. Patrick Allen is the former provost and professor of higher education at George Fox. Uh, he's also the author of Practicing the Prayer of St. Francis, which was a book that one of our Sunday school classes went through together last year. Okay, enough business and advertising. <laughs> the Lord be with you. So there's things people do that make us lean in and pay close attention. It happens when someone tells a fast-paced story with a lot of action. It happens when someone says something like, come closer, I have a secret. We lean in, we listen more carefully because we don't want to miss anything. We've been in the book of Mark for a few weeks now and that's the type of thing Mark does with his writing. See, there's two layers to what's being communicated. There's, there's Jesus instructing those around him. And then there's Mark instructing those reading his gospel. Within the story, Jesus is leading his disciples toward an understanding, and Mark is also guiding his readers, leading his readers toward an understanding by the way he puts the story together. Mark wants us paying attention, looking closely and listening closely, because the good news of God's kingdom is going to surprise us. It's gonna pop up in ways that we don't necessarily expect. If we get locked into one way of thinking, if we believe we've got God's kingdom all sorted out, we could miss God's kingdom work in the world. The passages of the last two weeks, they contain stories about Jesus teaching in parables and healings. The parables are intended to have multiple options for interpretation. They're intended to pull us in and cause us to wrestle together with what we do with them. That's how they work and that's how Jesus taught. If Jesus' goal was to make things evidently plain, he wouldn't have used parables. His goal is to draw the hearers in to active discerning, participation, listening together, and growing in understanding together. If they don't grasp it right away, well, the important thing is to stick with Jesus, and above all, to be open to whatever will be revealed. This is how Mark is telling the story in his writing. Stick with Jesus, pay attention, and be open to what Jesus reveals to us about the kingdom of God. So, let's take a look at what might be revealed to us in today's passage. No parables in this one, but a story about the healing of a demon-possessed man. The story brings up some important questions for us living in present-day culture. Questions like, does Jesus still do miraculous healings? And how closely is demon possession related to mental health? These questions touch all of us in one way or another. We all either have our own or know someone facing challenges with mental health and in need of healing. And if Jesus can heal this man, what about the person I care so deeply about? What about me? If you find yourself identifying with anything I've just said, know that in the midst of that, this congregation is a place for you, as you are, a place to call home and a place to find support. Well, those are important questions for us. The Gospel of Mark, well, that was written about 2,000 years ago, and they weren't asking the same questions we are about mental health. Just before today's passage in Mark chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples 
or in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And at that time, any sea, any large body of water, it represented all of the darkness and chaos. That's where it was contained. And as the disciples are frantically struggling against the storm and waves at sea, Jesus is asleep, not worried. Finally, they wake him up and Jesus calms the gale force, the gale force winds in a word saying silence. Be still. Since Mark chapter 1, when Jesus resisted Satan in the wilderness, it's been clear that Jesus had authority over all the dark powers of the world, including the demons. For Mark and the community he was writing to, Jesus' power and authority, it's settled, it's established. That wasn't the question they were asking in hearing this story. Our questions are important, but they're not always the same questions. Today's passage has one specific question in it, and it's asked by Jesus. What is your name? When we first learn of this man, he was called the demon-possessed man. He's defined as being demon-possessed living among the tombs, so out of control that no one was strong enough to restrain him. Even with chains and shackles, he would break them because he was so out of control. He's known as the man who night and day would howl and cut himself with stones. If this man has a name, it's of no consequence because he's entirely defined by his possession, by his situation by that thing that possesses him. And it's to this man that Jesus asks, what is your name? The man responds to the question by saying, legion is my name because we are many. Now it's not the man himself speaking, but these demons, what possesses him. The situation he's in, his condition, not only defines his existence, it's the thing speaking for him, so he has no voice. A legion of Roman soldiers consisted of 6,000 about soldiers, and they were a feared means of Roman political control. This reference to legion, well, Mark's community would have been very acquainted with that. Very acquainted with the threat of violence posed by Roman soldiers, especially in the name Legion. This isn't a coincidence, and it's not just about this man. See, in Mark's day, the entire region lived under what's often referred to as Pax Romana in Latin. It's Roman-imposed peace. It was peaceful because there was the constant fear and threat of violence from the occupying Roman soldiers. And to keep that threat and fear alive, well, every once in a while, they'd have to engage in a little bit of violence. A legion of soldiers could do immeasurable harm to a people who didn't fall in line with Roman wishes. We learn from Paul in his letters, along with other historical writers, that Roman citizens had more rights than non-Roman citizens. Readers of Mark's gospel would have been well acquainted with the fact that they were defined by a system of rule that considered non-Romans as less human, less worthy of rights that Roman citizens had. And Jesus stops to ask, what is your name? Earlier in the story, when Jesus was far off, the demons instantly know who Jesus is and the power Jesus has over them. Even from a great distance, they know who Jesus is, and they plead with Jesus not to send them out of the region, but instead into a herd of pigs nearby. The text says Jesus gives the demons permission to leave the man to go into the pigs. The herd of pigs uh, says about 2,000 of them, they rush down a cliff into a lake and they drown. It's understandable that those trusted with caring for the pigs would run off and tell the story. They were in charge of the herd, and that herd was a significant financial investment for someone in the town, maybe even multiple people in the town. Herds have been maybe combined 
so that the same group of people could watch them. The herd was a source of income and food and trade. It was a huge financial loss, losing 2,000 pigs. Those tending the herds didn't want to get blamed for the loss, and while Jesus was still around, they wanted to make sure the townspeople knew exactly who was responsible and that it wasn't their fault. It's understandable. The townspeople were angry, and when the angry people come to investigate, they see the formerly demon-possessed man, and that's all they call him, because he's still defined by his less human status. It only works for so long, being defined by something that you used to be. In the year 1993, because of a contract dispute with Warner Brothers, the musician and performing artist Prince changed his stage name to an unpronounceable symbol. He began to be referred to as the artist formerly known as Prince, or T-A-F-K-A-P for short. Here in Mark, 2,000 years earlier, we have the formerly demon-possessed man, Jesus, and a group of very angry townspeople. The townspeople plead with Jesus to leave, and similar to how the demons pleaded with Jesus a few verses earlier, and Jesus gets in a boat and leaves. In the midst of that, Jesus tells the FDPM, or formerly demon-possessed man, to go home and tell people there in his home about what the Lord has done for him and how he has been shown mercy, which the FDPM does. And everyone was amazed. By casting out the demon or the demons, Jesus redefines this man's existence. The man was defined by his demon possession and the actions it brought about, defined in the community, known in the community. By healing this man, Jesus restores his humanity. Jesus rehumanizes this man and frees him, not only from the demon possession, but from the way that that possession defined him within his community for so long. This man has been shown mercy by being freed from that which defined him as less than human. And yet he remains without a name. He's rehumanized by Jesus, and that's the good news of the kingdom of God. That was shocking news to Mark's readers, who had been defined as less than human by the Roman system of government. And everyone was amazed. In the kingdom of God, people are defined by the fact that they are, we are, children of God. Our situations, our frailties, our failures, and our mistakes, our diagnoses, they don't define us. In the kingdom of God, we're freed and we're rehumanized. There were early church arguments, controversies about the humanity and divinity of Jesus. Well, which was more, or was it both? Because Jesus was fully human and fully God, our humanity is not incompatible with God, with the divine. Humanity is not the thing that we have to overcome in order to follow Jesus. Our humanity is a gift from God that draws us closer to God and closer to one another because it's something we have in common. Jesus goes about announcing the good news of the kingdom of God, and he does that by restoring people's humanity. They have a name, and that name is child of God. We don't find out what the man's name is in the story, but he couldn't go for very long being known as the formerly demon-possessed man. He'd tell his story, and he would eventually have a name, and he would now be defined by the fact that his humanity had been restored. He had been freed and given mercy. And it's important to recognize that the rehumanization of this man it came at a significant cost to the entire community. And they were angry about that cost. 
It didn't come for free. Jesus clearly understood that rehumanizing this man was worth the cost. So, Jesus rehumanizes the possessed man. That's what the good news of God's kingdom does. It rehumanizes. I can't help but make a connection to this past Monday and Martin Luther King Jr. Day. The day set aside in our nation to recognize the civil rights movement, a movement in many forms that still seeks to rehumanize people of color because they're mistakenly seen as less human than white people. There is still so much work to be done in the area of rehumanizing people. There are still voices and movements and systems at work that actively dehumanize people based on the color of their skin and all kinds of other things. People are defined as less than human because of their ethnicity, color, or gender, or orientation, a diagnosis, which side of a national border they're on, and so many other made up reasons. The good news of God's kingdom is not yet experienced by all people. As participants in the kingdom of God, we not only experience our own rehumanization, but we're freed and invited to take up the work of actively rehumanizing others. In so much as we engage in that rehumanization, we are participating in the kingdom of God right here and right now while we wait for Christ's return and the final inauguration of God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, we're rehumanized and invited to join in the task of rehumanizing others. That is Jesus' work and the work of God's kingdom. As this story in Mark warns us, though, we should not be surprised when the important work we have been invited into turns out to be costly and makes people angry. Let's stand and respond in singing. Let us come lead us. A hymnal worship book, the blue one, page 371. 371.
our prayers of the people. I'm going to have the microphone available if you'd like to share. Sometimes we do that in our service as a response to the message this morning. Um, if you have a prayer request, if you have a praise, I want to do this especially because we have some guests here that I appreciate that have been a part of my life when we attended Pacific Covenant Mennonite Church. Ron and Elva Miller and their daughter Michelle. It's good to see you and have you worshiping with us. Um, it's just kind of a little bit of a reunion for me. So would you like to share a little bit? <laughs> Put you on the spot. It's so delightful to see everybody. Wow. And to see, and I think, what's their name? Who is that? It's so, so much fun. But you know, I was thinking it's more than just humanity. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Jesus Christ flowing through us. The peace, the healing. It's not even us, it's him. That's what it's all about. was a Sunday school teacher for our boys while we were at Pacific Covenant, worked with the children a lot, so I really appreciate the impact that you had um, with my children. Yeah. Anyone else like to share? We've all survived the week without any injuries, maybe. Jerry. Jerry Hostler. I'm, <laughs> I'm the big kid that was up there with the little kids. I had a, I had a career in talking to young children, so it was, so it's easy for me, and it was fun. I, I thought in my, my mind, right before you in, issued an invitation, I'd like to go out. So when you said that, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, reject it. And that isn't the reason I asked for the microphone. <laughs> I'm on the verge of kidney dialysis, and I have several steps to go through to, to get that started, so I'm guessing sometime within the next, uh, 30 to 40 days, I'll be engaged in that. But in the, in the meantime, I have things to, doctors to visit, things to do. So I'd appreciate prayers for peace and guidance. Thank you. We will pray for you. Anyone else would like to share? Ron, back to the Millers. I really appreciate the sermon uh, in the context of that passage in Mark. Um, he really brought it to life. Um, but I just have a question that I've often pondered related to this particular incident. And that is, um, he brought out good the relative merits of uh, of uh, the dollar value of these pigs versus the, uh, the spiritual and the wholeness, the, the humanity, if you will, of this person. Uh, but I often wondered, why wasn't that a herd of sheep or a herd of cattle? Something to ponder. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, this is Cynthia. Uh, I have two prayer requests. One is actually one of Caleb's friends at EMU. Um, her name's Carla Hostetter. She had a pretty significant um, sledding accident at EMU this week and um, had significant damage to both her spleen and one of her kidneys. Um, she is doing better, but it's, a, it's been a really hard week for their uh, family for her and continued prayers would be uh, welcome especially for restoration of one of her kidneys which at this it, so far isn't uh, functioning correctly um second thing um it has to do with the sermon also um which if you think about the the phrase actively rehumanizing others 
Uh, one of the good demonstrations of that this week was um, Mennonite Action, which I don't know how much uh, people know about or follow in Mennonite Action. Um, but they, um, a group of people from Mennonite Action actually went to the Capitol this week. Um, 135 people were arrested as they were singing. Um, in, in great Mennonite tradition, they were singing beautiful. Um, I, I was following along, singing online. <laughs> beautiful Mennonite songs, um, just calling for ceasefire and peace to the Middle East. Um, it was, it, my tears were partly out of sorrow for Gaza, but also partly out of, it was so inspiring to watch. Um, in the good Mennonite tradition, as one of the first things that was done in the Capitol is that um, the police arrested the song leaders. <laughs> because they wouldn't stop singing. And as soon as the song leaders were arrested in the spirit of being Mennonite, the Mennonites kept singing. <laughs> so as soon as uh, one group of people was arrested, another group you know, took it up. Um, they also uh, didn't, couldn't take people away immediately. So in the spirit of trying to break the group up um, in groups of 10, they moved them to stand in a circle around the room, around the Capitol. Well, what happens when you put Mennonites in a circle who are singing? <laughs> the singing got louder, the singing got um, even more inspirational. Um, I was listening this morning, uh, I often listen in the morning to Shalom Mennonite in Harrisonburg, and some of the leadership um, is from that congregation. And they were just saying that, you know, during the, during the singing, uh, periodically the Capitol Police would come on with a megaphone and do an announcement. Um, sometimes they had um, like alarms going off or something trying to stop them and get their attention. And she said the singing was so loud and so inspirational and overpowering that, that it actually couldn't be heard. And so in, in thinking about the sermon, thinking about rehumanizing others, you know, and I also really related to, you know, what Lois said this morning, like, there's just some depressing news out there, but our hope is our voices, and the Mennonites are really good at putting their voices out there and being a sign of hope and peace and justice to the world. And so you all just make me smile this morning. That group makes me smile. And if you want to know more about Mennonite action, you can look up the group online, or I'd be happy to tell you more. So thank you. One of their songs, and the world is about to turn. My heart will sing of the daybreak. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I saw that video and I just thought, this is my tribe. These are my people that are trying to make a difference and be a voice um, at the Capitol. So let's go to prayer. Jesus, as we follow you. We just give thanks and praise that we can be here worshiping together, surrounded by your grace. Renew our hearts today with these things that have been shared, these insights of ways to be salt and light in a hurting and broken world. I thank you for keeping us all safe this past week as we dealt with ice and cold. As we follow you, Jesus, we offer our concerns and requests of those that have been shared. We lift Jerry Hostler. Carla Hostetter. Kathy LeBear, Felix Burleson, God, we lift others who are dealing with health challenges. We ask for healing and strengthening as they recover, as they're waiting, Allow their bodies to rest, to be at peace. 
And God, give us creative ways of dealing with violence and injustice in our world. We want our world to turn. Help us to be your people growing stronger together who name truth, who know what it means to be in community, moving towards a common dream of a new heaven and a new earth in the power of the love of God. Lord, we pray that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit to be peace with one another, peace with God, peace in our world. Amen. I had a little bit of difficulty coming up with a benediction for all of the same reasons that were have been mentioned already um, about the world and the problems of this uh, passage in Mark. You know, the destruction of um, other people's livelihoods, not to mention the environmental problem of 2,000 drowned pigs. Um, but I think I can really appreciate um, Steve's emphasis on rehumanizing people who are on the fringes, even at a cost. I'm going to read just a few lines from Worship Resources, um, number 1058, as our benediction. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed with all who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, so that you may reach out to bring comfort. Amen.